I thought well, a lot of people stayed home because it was cold. But now it's filled up. <laughs> glad of that. Glad that you're here. Hopefully the lesson that uh, I'm going to bring this morning is not so redundant. Christian, what you need to do uh, to be a Christian, if you um, already are one, like I said, you probably know what this is going to be about. If you've not obeyed the gospel, uh, then you're not a Christian. And if you're not a person who's, a, as a, who's obeyed the gospel and you're not following Christ, uh, then um, the term Christian means follower, and that simply means that you're not following him. Now, the result is the same with well, those who are Christians, those who are, uh, that are not following Him, and those who are not Christians. Because we must be faithful unto death. Revelation 2, verse 10 says that, because then we'll receive the crown of life. And other passages that talk about that. Well, that's kind of what we're going to deal with today, is some of those, uh, answering some of those things. And tonight's lesson is going to be about answering uh, objections that some denominational churches make. So first of all, let's talk about, you know, obeying the gospel. And obeying the gospel is doing what is necessary to become a Christian. Now, some people have the misunderstanding of thinking that all a person needs to do is just be a good moral person. Well, a Christian should be a good moral person, but that's not enough. You think it's enough to just be a good moral person? Jesus died for your sins, and if he died for your sins, how, how do you appropriate that forgiveness? How do you get to the point where you, you believe and know that Jesus has taken away your sin? There are a lot of people who tell you what it is, but if you don't go by what the Bible says, you're just not going to make it. That's what we're doing this lesson. In fact, we don't want to leave anything undone that uh, might be ambiguous at all. And so being a Christian begins by obeying the gospel. When the passage was read a moment ago, what must I do to be saved? That was the, the scene of that was the, they were in Philippi, and Paul and Silas were in prison there. Um, not quite like the jail that you might see today of prison life, and I've never been in prison, and, uh, but what, what you understand about it, you know, somebody is confined. Your freedom is taken away. You have to do what other people tell you to do. When they were in prison, Paul and Silas, because they were children of God, they, they weren't too distressed and um, because they knew God was with them and they were singing praises. And you can imagine the, the Roman soldiers there, the, 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 the gentlemen who were guarding him. Uh, you can just imagine. He never, he probably never heard anybody singing in there before. And a lot of times, being in prison in the in the first century, if you stayed in there very long, you weren't probably going to make it out of it. We think today that prisoners have we have were obliged to provide for them in a lot of different ways. I remember doing some. Bible class work in a prison in Columbia, South Carolina, talking to the chaplain there. He says, if someone there claims to be uh, a Satanist, that's their religion, and he has to provide material for them to worship their God the way he wants to worship, and in, in, within reason. And, and so, if there's books that he needs, and he chaplain has to get them for him, that him, he, it irritates him to death to do that, but you have, he, they, they didn't have an obligation to feed prisoners. The only reason they would feed prisoners is to keep them alive until trial, if they stayed alive. Sometimes it would take months. 
may be years for that to occur. So this is the scenario we're at. Here Paul and Silas are singing, you know, prayers, and, and God opens the doors of the jail. And probably the other prisoners probably took off, and the, the jail center said, uh, he's thinking about maybe killing himself. Because he knew if his prisoners left, he'd be killed. He had an obligation to those who were over him. And so when they come out and they said, oh no, we're, we're here. And then Jared says, what must I do to be saved? It says, and they took him that same hour of the night and he was baptized. And then, and they went to his house and he washed their stripes and, and they, they spoke the word of God more completely to them and he and his whole house obeyed the gospel. So when we think about a, a way in which we can see an example of what people did and that's, that's really what we're looking for if we want to obey the gospel because it doesn't make any difference what some television evangelist says or some preacher like myself it doesn't make any difference what we say. If we say things that are what God says, then we all ought to be listened to. When we think about this further in obeying the gospel and some of the things that they did that would cause us to, to understand that that's part of things that we need to do. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. It talks about faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so... The Word of God doesn't speak to us, but the idea of hearing it is we read and study what the Word of God says and we're understanding of it. And then there's believing. And the passage on uh, Acts 6, 16.31 talks about that, about believing the Lord Jesus Christ in thy house, and thou shalt be saved. Hebrews 11.6 says this is without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Are you a seeker? Are you a truth seeker? Are you a seeker of God? Or would you rather, just because of your lifestyle, maybe you just rather leave God alone? Some of us live a lifestyle that God doesn't approve of. And we'd rather have not have people talk to us about religion or talk to us about God because I know that God demands things of us. I've heard me say before that Christmas time is a, is a time that on December 25th that people all over the world celebrate the birth of Jesus. And, all, and, all, and, and, and Christmas is a really big holiday and religiously, you know, it's, it's a babe lying in a manger doesn't ask anything of us, but a crucified Savior on a cross ask something of us. Ask us to take up our cross daily to follow him. John 8, 24. You know, you must believe. If you don't believe that he is, then uh, your life isn't worth anything. <laughs> Romans 10, 9 and 10, that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the, with the mouth, belief, uh, confession is made unto uh, righteousness. And so, uh, when we think about this, we've got to not just believe in God, but we need to believe God. We need to believe what He says. We need to believe God what He says and then be willing to do it. It's one thing to know, you know, what to do, because a lot of people don't know what to do. They just don't want to do it. I remember as a as a boy, as a friend of mine who was talking about or thinking about obeying the gospel, he said, I remember he said to me, and I wasn't a Christian at the time, he, he said, he said, well, I don't think I'm ready. And I asked him, I said, well, what do you need to do to be ready? And it was, it was kind of a question that was kind of weird because I was kind of seeking information a little bit, but he took it differently. He, he took it as, well, you know, that's right. What I need to do is just is to obey. It's to do it. To find out what the Bible says and then do it. And he knew. His dad was a deacon in the church there. And he knew. So we think about this, about individuals like Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Now Nicodemus believed in Jesus, but 
he didn't believe enough to come to him in the daytime. He believed in Jesus because he says, you know, no, man, no man can do the things that you do unless God be with him. So we must understand that if God was, and of course the, there is an assumption there that Nicodemus was correct and Nicodemus was correct. God was with this Jesus of Nazareth. We find later that Nicodemus at the crucifixion, he's the one who wants to gather the body and take it away and put it in a tomb. And of course Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And he was risking a lot of things by going there. So apparently his belief process had led him to where he would stand up for Christ from where he was before in his acknowledgement. He, he knew who he was, but it wasn't until Jesus was crucified that he, his, his faith was fulfilled. His faith was, had been it built, it had grown. What else do we need to do in obeying the gospel? Some people believe belief is all there is, but yet the Bible does teach that one must repent, Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, the remission of your sins, you shall receive the Holy Ghost. And so it is that Luke 13.35, those two verses say the exact same thing. I tell you, nay, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. This needs to be understood before one obeys the gospel. Sometimes we don't necessarily linger long on passages that talk about repentance. We want to get somebody to believe. We want to get them, when they believe, see, we think the other thing is going to fall in place. But we don't do enough teaching on repentance or confession. Or and we certainly hit the baptism thing. What about living faithfully under death? I, I hope that I've done a good job in the last three years that I've been here. Yes, it hasn't been that long. Uh, so we've got to understand that repentance is necessary. And, and many people fail to remain faithful because they don't, they don't know the importance of repentance. You know, they have sin in their life and they just they don't think about what they need to do. They don't think about a life that says repentance is necessary. And repentance is necessary because we know and understand it's necessary to go to heaven. It's not just mere belief, but belief certainly is something that will get you started, if you will. But confessing Jesus as Savior, we quoted Matthew 10, 9, and 10, and then chapter, uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 37, uh, with the eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch, says, I, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's a confession that we need to make and understand that what that means. When we say Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, then, then we need to understand that we need to submit to Him. There's, there's no other person that we need to submit to in that relationship that's going to provide salvation. Acts 4 verse 12, there either is a salvation under any name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And that's where salvation lies, is in Christ. John 14, 6 is another passage, you know, that talks about says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father but by me. So then we understand about, about baptism. <coughs> baptism is taught. Uh, matter of fact, every lesson uh, that I talk about or bring, top, whether it's topical or textual, uh, every lesson I bring, we talk about this thing, about what one needs to do to be saved. And the denominational world will tell you different. You ever have anybody come up to you and say, well, "Are you saved?" You know, I, I want you know I want to be a smart aleck. I want to say, "Saved from what? <laughs> saved from what?" And they'll say, "Well, saved from damnation." And I said, "Well, how do you do that?" He said, "We well, ask Jesus to come into your heart." I said, "How do you know that?" Well, that's what Joel Osteen says. <laughs> you know, that, I remember growing up there were some. TV evangelist was one in Ohio called Rex Humbard. I used to watch him when I was a kid, you know, and, and he was powerful, you know, and he and I forget that where he was at. I think it was maybe Columbus, I'm not sure. I don't know it was Ohio, I think. Anyway, I know I think. So uh, but you never heard him talk about baptism. You never hear Billy Graham talk about baptism. You never heard, hear Joel Osteen or John A. G. or D. D. Jakes or anybody. They don't talk about baptism. And why is that? 
Because when the, in the first century, when the New Testament church comes into existence, what are they told? They say, man, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. If you want remission of sins, you've got to repent and be baptized. It's, it's, it's an equation that we need to understand. It's, it's a plus equation. Mark 16, 15, and 16. Excuse me, 16. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. So, you know, there's obviously to me, I say obviously, but to me, I understand there's more than one thing that one has to do. In fact, there are several things, and we talked about them. That one needs to believe in God and believe in Jesus Christ as, as the Son of God. We need to repent of our sins. We need to confess Him as Lord of our life uh, when we do that. And, but we must be baptized. What happens if somebody's in the hospital and they're not given an opportunity to live? They say they're going to die, and they say, well, they need to be baptized. Well, then go baptize them. You see, some people say, well, God knows their heart. And that's true. God does know their heart. But he also needs to see actions. He needs to see that person pick up their cross and follow Christ. Fortunately, it's a metaphorical statement. It doesn't mean you literally have to drag around a big hunk of wood. Taking up our cross means taking up the fight against evil. Taking up our cross to follow Christ, to do what, to emulate what he did. And I, I've seen many people be in a hospital, be baptized. Matter of fact, I think it was a, um, in one, Steve Hill uh, baptized somebody in the hospital. I think it was... Uh, Comanche County uh, in that time. I'm not sure of that, but I, I know I saw pictures on Facebook where he baptized somebody in the hospital, and you can do that. Uh, you, you have to be careful because you don't run the hospital, and you need to go through the right channels to get that done. And it can be done. And why is it done? Because it's absolutely necessary. I think that might have been the last sermon that I gave here before I left. That baptism is necessary. It's essential to one's salvation. These passages certainly teach that. So when we think about obeying the gospel, what is it we need to do? We talk about believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. But also we need to live faithfully unto death. And becoming a Christian is, is this the beginning of life. It's the beginning of our spiritual life. And, and these passages bear that out. Revelation 2 10, we quoted earlier. And it describes becoming a Christian, this idea of obeying the gospel. But we must continue to obey the gospel. We must continue to emulate the life of Christ. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 1, be imitators of me as I also am of Christ Jesus. Paul didn't want people to be, he wants followers. He said, if you want to follow somebody, follow, follow me if I follow Christ. If I don't follow Christ, he, he shouldn't be following me. Because Peter was a fallible man, so was Paul and others. You know, in, in the New Testament time, and, and just as we are, you know, we commit sin. So, uh, I've kind of alluded to this already, but why, why should one become a Christian? Because it's the only way you're going to be saved. Somebody asks you that question, are you saved? Somebody asks me that question, I'm going to tell them yes. If you want to qualify it, you say yes, as long as I obey the gospel. As long as I live faithfully unto death. But, you know, too many times over the years, you know, I've heard people say, and you, I've brought this out before, people say, well, are you saved? Well, I hope to be, and I want to be. Well, you can be. And so when you think about those things, you know you can, so why don't you? Why don't you live faithfully? These passages teach that. I quoted those earlier. And they're privileges 
and blessings of being a Christian that sometimes we don't even think about. We have access to God. 1 Peter 3 and verse 12 talks about how God looks upon the righteous. His eyes are upon the righteous and his ear, uh, and this is actually Isaiah, and his ear is not so heavy that he cannot hear. But his face is turned away from those who do evil. And a person doing evil, that, that's a very broad subject. It certainly would be to deny <coughs> Jesus as the Christ and Lord of our life, right? That would certainly be something. But if we, we have prayer where we can repent and we can reestablish that, that continuity with Christ. We may be out of Christ for a while, but that doesn't mean we're out of church. We may be not in a good relationship with Christ, but that still means that you're a brother and sister of Christ. You're just an error. And repentance can bring that back. Confession of those sins. And repentance, is, as long as you're alive, you still repent. When we think about these things, as long as you're alive, you can have access to God. The faithful have access to God. I, as a Christian, I have a spiritual family that encourages me and cares about my spiritual well-being. So, there are other benefits of being a Christian. The privilege is, is answering questions in life. I can go to the Bible and find the answers that God has provided me to those things that, are, uh, that I question in life. Like, where did I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? And the Bible provides answers to those problematic questions that we have. But it requires faith, but not, not a blind faith. You know, it's not like saying, somebody says, well, you can, you can leap off a cliff, and you can fly. Well, that's just, that's crazy. You know better than that. You remember the uh, Indiana Jones movie where he had to cross that, that invisible walkway over that chasm? He stepped out on faith, but his faith was not blinded. He couldn't see it. But he had the faith to know that it was there. For us, we have that faith. We know Christ is there. We, we know he's ready to, to, to listen to us and mediate for us. As uh, 2 Timothy 2.5 talks about, he is our mediator. And so we have, those are some of the privileges that we have in being a Christian. We've seen already what it takes to be a Christian by obeying the gospel. You've heard the gospel already. And so it's only up to you when you decide that you want to obey that gospel and not. It, it's up to you. The only thing standing between you and the gospel is you. But you've got to make that choice. Those who have obeyed the gospel one time but are not in a good relationship with Christ, they need to reestablish that. They need to confess their sins and repent. And God will welcome you back if you repent of your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of your sins. You confess them as well. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 7 and 9. So, but verse 8 even says, we deceive ourselves, you know, the truth is not in us. So we, we need to understand that we should not deceive ourselves and think everything is going to be okay as long as I'm a good moral person. It's not going to be. It's not going to be okay. The blood of Jesus and how we contact that blood is in his death. And so in his death, when we're baptized, that's where we're, our sins are washed away. Revelation 1 5 says we're washed in that blood. There again, figurative language. We're washed in that blood. We're in the, the baptism, the water of baptism, baptism comes through a pipe that comes from city water. There's nothing magical about it, but God uses that as a tool. And he uses that as a tool in order to take away your sin by your willingness and your obedience to follow Him. If there's any way we can help you this morning, if you need to come back to Christ or become a Christian, won't you come once again and we stand and sing?